Hey everybody, welcome to Chew Stream, where we talk about art and life as an artist. I'm your host, Bobby Chu, and I also have on here my co-host, the wonderful Masei Seki. If you are catching this live, feel free to ask us questions in the chat, but make sure to write the word question in big capital letters so that we can see them easier. If you're listening to this pre-recorded and would like to catch a live stream, look up the words schoolism newsletter and sign up. You'll get free helpful videos for artists, notifications of live streams like this, free tutorials and news from the Schoolism newsletter. So definitely remember to sign up for that. Today's guest is the wonderful Annie Award-winning Tuna Bora. She is a freelance visual development artist currently living in Los Angeles. She's been living on her own since the age of 14. She moved from Turkey to America as a teenager and has worked her way into the animation industry. She recently won the Annie Award for production design on the film Pearl, which was directed by Oscar-winning director Patrick Osborne. He directed Feast which won the uh, Oscar for him. And this short, Pearl, that I'm talking about, was the first Oscar-nominated virtual reality animated short film. So without further ado, here is the wonderful, the talented Tuna Bora. Please enjoy. I just want to go to the very first question here. Yes. What does your daily art grind look like these days? Uh, that's a good question. I think the very nature of what I do, my daily grind changes a lot. Um, I'm, I, I work mostly freelance or on contract, which means there are really stressful, heavy moments and there are some lighter moments. Uh, these weeks, most of the work I'm doing is writing. So I'll do my daily painting and I'll do my writing, but in between it's mostly meeting people and pushing those projects through. So, um, I actually, I know it sounds more relaxed, but it's me starting to work on a new skill in an area where I haven't necessarily proven myself. So in a way, it's for me harder than the typical grind of starting, taking on a normal job. I usually work from 10 to 7, try to wake up and uh, usually try to write three pages in the morning, which takes me about 25 minutes. And, um, you know, in between the day and the work and the check-ins with whichever director I'm working with. There's uh, other calls for other projects. So, you know, it's mostly trying to schedule everything. And in the evening, because I spend some time on the daily drawing, that leaves me, you know, maybe some time to hang out with friends and read and make dinner. And uh, hence, it can feel like a grind, but it's quite enjoyable, actually. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm one for trying to celebrate all those moments. So a typical, typical work day is like that. 10 to 7, uh, work lunch calls, uh, writing in the morning, doing the daily, uh, and making time for people, uh, people I love. <laughs> so you mean like 10 a.m. till 7 p.m. or 6.50 a.m., that's when you start? No, it's 10 a.m. to 7, because that's a lot of L.A. companies work at that time. Animation sometimes is a little bit earlier, but most directors are most comfortable with 10 to 7, I think. So that's what I do. Right on. A lot of uh, freelancers tend to go really heavy with the hours. So it's really nice to see that you found the balance. It took me a while to find the balance with that, too. Uh, because with freelance, I feel like you constantly try to prove yourself, <laughs> especially if you're working with people you haven't worked with before and you want to be reliable. And uh, not to be a little bit hard on production sometimes, but they book you for a number of time. And sometimes they don't get, get, get back to you with notes on time because their clients didn't get back to them or their schedule stagnates and then it pushes and they're late to all their meetings, including yours. So sometimes they don't get back to you on time to finish your work on time. I'm a very strong believer in realizing that you are an entity and so are they, meaning uh, they are a business. If they are late to the meeting, that's also on them. So I'll do my best till seven. If I can, you know, like rush through some stuff and get it done. And if there's a deadline, I try to be a little bit flexible, but essentially, um, you as an individual shouldn't be required to put your life on hold because their schedule pushed back. 
most things in life, uh, as far as jobs go, they don't need to become the individual's priority. It's the, it's the company's priority. So if that means they have to extend your hours and pay you extra, they should do that. If it means that they have to hire more people, they should do that. Because in the end, this is uh, first and foremost their job. Having said that, um, you know, if, if it's, there's a strong working relationship with that individual and I'm able to and I want to put an extra time, it's rare, but I will do that because I really want to see this thing succeed, you know. But otherwise, I try to, you know, you need to be respectful for you to have other people also be respectful of your time and your life. Oh, yeah, yeah, should, totally. I, yeah. I agree yeah. 100%. I'm just saying like the... Uh, what I've seen from other freelancers is that they they tend to go heavy with the hours, you know. Um, sure. I just want to mention, Arthur, we did see your question. I'm going to get to that one next. Uh, I was just saying that this is going to be the very first question. I just picked one at random. Okay, so okay. Um, Arthur, we didn't forget. We didn't forget about you. <laughs> Hi, Arthur. Yeah. So, I I just, you know, I totally get what you're saying, and and a different approach that. Um, that I found works quite well is mm -hmm. I, I would tell them, you know, I, I'm billing them per day, right? And so mm -hmm. I'm, I might have like five free days, but then instead I would tell them, okay, I only have three days available, mm -hmm. you know? And so I'm going to bill you for three days. If I can do four days, would you like me to just do four days or should I ask you you know, get that okay from them. And then what I do is because, you know, freelance, you're going to charge a lot more than when you work in-house. If you don't get three days worth of work, then I, I still think to myself, well, you know, we're getting paid like pretty darn well. So I'll do another <laughs> day until it looks like three days of work and then I'll hand it in and everybody's happy. Right? Because yeah. when you're working in-house, like... I don't know if you're actually working on location, but when you're working on location and y you know you work the whole entire day, you get nothing done that you like. Mm -hmm. There's no question that you were at work. But if you're working exactly. right in Toronto or you're working from home, they only know if you actually worked if you have something to show them. Yeah, and I think this is where uh, freelance or not. There's a very important mindset that took me a long time to learn. Um, my job, one way or another, is to help the vision of somebody else's direction come to life. So my job is to make that interesting. My job is to make them feel satisfied about uh, what they're presenting to their client or what they're putting in their project. So part of my job is helping them uh, define what it is that they're looking for. Part of it is helping guide them through that train of thought. Some directors are particularly good at this and some aren't very good at this. And that's okay, you know. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, I think there is a value in that. So sometimes it is better for me to give them maybe six really good options that are well thought out. Then for, for me to just go off on my own and give them a hundred options, which tends to confuse the directors who don't have a very specific vision for what they want. Mm -hmm. And that they start Frankensteining different things because they feel like they need to comment on all, all hundred drawings, right? But that actually ends up with a less powerful design mm -hmm. because, you know, it's like a kid at a candy store in a way. So I'd rather bring a smaller number of really considerate, well-working ideas and designs than to just seem like I'm working super hard. Basically, in the end, if uh, for the production I've done a really great job and the thing we present is strong, that satisfies most people I work with a lot more than just having you know a bunch of weird sketches, but what we put together just feels distracted and not very focused. And I kind of call that the the sniper approach you know you, you pick <laughs> your target that. and you're really aiming for that you might shoot off far less bullets but they will be exactly where you want to, them to land as opposed to like a shotgun blast you know let's just render out a whole bunch of random stuff and hopefully <laughs> one thing sticks with them exactly i think shooting in the dark is a little bit fun in the very beginning but you 
definitely to be able to hone in on what it is that you're there to do. And it matters if you're good at that or not. And this is part of it, right? So, yeah, I, I know I can get a lot done and I can get a lot of meaningful things done in seven hours. So I'd rather use my time well than to, um, you know, you can work for 20 hours, but if you're not hitting that target, it's not really going to matter. So that's why I try to keep the hours very strict. And more importantly, uh, you know, most of us, we got into art because we love to draw and we love to make stuff and we love to work with others. I don't know if the last one applies to everyone, actually. But um, it is also about how that fits into your life. The the direction we take into creative fields often has to do with how we don't, um, maybe at a young age, identify with the typical lifestyle, the stereotypical lifestyle of having a nine to five, right? It yeah. has to do with how we want to express ourselves and live a more creative, fulfilling life. If you are using yourself as this person whose time doesn't matter, whose life doesn't matter, the and you know this very well, I know, you're probably not going to feel very satisfied about your life. And I think that's very important. It has to do not just with the energy you bring on to your work, but also about how you live your life. When you turn around and look at your life at the age of 65, what do you want to see? Is it that you lived a nice, peaceful life and you were able to give a lot of value to other people's projects and let it grow? That's awesome. Oh, I used like yeah. I constantly think <laughs> about the 65, 75, 85-year-old Bobby. Do you picture constantly like, you know, you're, you're thinking that far into the future, Tuna? Uh, I'm constantly thinking about that, yes, and constantly <laughs> thinking about how can I be happier there and how can I get there sooner? Like, if I can get to that point, I want to be there when I'm 65, but if I'm there when I'm 35 or 45 or 55, that's even better, right? It just opens more room to want more out of life and then bring that to myself. So it's, like, so much better. Also, at 75, I'm probably going to be home, like, yelling with a cane at the flying cars passing by, but that's okay, you know? <laughs> well, we don't want to uh, make Arthur wait until he's 65, so I'm just going to go to Arthur's yes. question now. So he asks, apart from art school, studying art can feel a lot like you're lost at sea. Mm -hmm. What do I do when I don't know where to go next? What to learn? How to practice? Sometimes I feel just lost. That's a super fair question to ask. And I feel like we all do feel lost sometimes. So I can super deeply relate to this. And even now, I think I'm trying to figure out what my next step is and where do I want to go. And uh, I think part of that is embracing that your wants and needs are going to change from time to time. And I think the feeling like you're falling off of something when you finish college is a very common feeling that I have seen and I, I felt it too. Part of it is because the school tells you what you need to learn, right? The school tells you if you do this, these six things or if you finish these 10 classes, you're going to have enough. You're going to be in a good place. So there is a safety net of having somebody else determine what you need to do. And then you graduate and you feel like the sea is boundless. Yeah, so, but a lot of times, you know, as a student, uh, you know, you don't know enough of anything to really know what direction you want to go into. You know, I, I've heard this from many mm -hmm. students. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's fair. I recently had a talk, gave a talk, and this is part of what I was speaking about. I think, especially school makes you think of uh, your life and your success in the, in the terms of what title do you have, uh, how well-known you are maybe, where you fit into the marketplace, how, your, how good your rendering skills might be compared to other people's. And a lot of schools I know don't do a very good job of letting or uh, teaching students to ask these questions regularly. They almost like that maybe some kids don't ask those questions so they don't have to answer it, right? I think uh, what... what what would help you guide yourself a little bit better and feel a little less lost is actually just starting to listen to yourself a little bit more. So it is easy to say, for instance, that 
when I graduated, I thought I just wanted to be a visitor artist, right? I have other skills and I have other tendencies and other things I love to do and kind of trying to fit myself into either the visual development box or designer box and all this other stuff was really crippling the, the freedom that I wanted to feel. And part of that for me had to do with starting to do my own work without trying to achieve a goal with it. At least for, let's say, that day, if I were doing a daily for an hour, for that hour, I tried to forget what I want to become and what I want this work to do for me. So a lot of times when we sit down and start to work, it's easy to say, hey, I'm going to do something so great that it's going to take care of all my problems. It's going to make me super happy with my work. It's going to make other people realize how great I am. It's going to get me the job I want. And it's okay to want all those things, but it's not fair to expect yourself to sit down and make that one piece that's going to convince everybody, and more importantly, yourself, that everything is great, right? I've, so, Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, I, I'm just going to wrap it up, but basically saying if for one hour a day you can forget where you want to go and you can make something, you're going to definitely feel a lot less lost. <laughs> At least that's my experience. Um, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Well, I just want to bring uh, Masay uh, into this conversation because Masay is the youngest amongst us. <laughs> and so she remembers how it was still of like, uh, you know, being in school and, and trying to figure <laughs> out what she wants to do. And maybe you can share some of your thoughts in this. Like, how did you figure out what you want to do with your art career? Oh, uh, for me, oh, it's kind of hard just because I am starting into the industry a bit, um, you know, recently. So, uh, <laughs> well, I I think um, a good part of it is that you actually, you know, in the beginning, you you still might not know exactly what you want to do. So, like, you just kind of mm -hmm. go for the opportunities that are given to you and see if you want to mm -hmm. do it again, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, why don't we go on to another question here? With uh, let's go to Carlos's question. Carlos Rue. He asks, "How do you develop a visual library effectively?" My teacher says that I need to do a mental folder for the poses and types of body parts and bodies and that that I copy, but I found that to be very difficult. Hmm. That's also a super fair question. Let's see. Um, I think what your teacher is referring to there has a little bit to do with working productively in a production. That's how I see this, is like to effectively bring what people want from you in a really short amount of time. You need to have a go-to for how you're tackling these problems. So I think in a way what they're trying to build with you in that library is a sense of process for when you have an assignment. So I think it's okay for you to find a process that works as long as it works for the job. It can be however you want it to be. So if you have the kind of teacher who wants to focus on this, I think this could be an incredible opportunity for you to try a few different ways of putting that together and your teacher can most likely tell you, hey, Nate, this is good, but maybe you can include this other thing and it will be even better. Or they could say, this really works. Maybe this can be your process. You can keep applying this. You know, you have the great opportunity to really build a process for yourself. And I would take that as a super win that your, that your teacher cares about it. So more so than library, I think it is uh, trying to make sure that you have a way of tackling problems so then you don't feel overwhelmed by the task. What do you think, Bobby? Yeah, I wonder. I, I like the question that goes in my head is, is it more effective to first study the tiny little pieces that make up the whole? Or do you start at the whole and you break it down into tiny little pieces? I kind of feel like it's, it's the latter. I think the latter works better too as, a, as an overall like longevity plan for your career <laughs> because I know a lot of people who can do the little details but they really uh, struggle with the bigger picture when it 
becomes the the uh, task later on in their career. Yeah. So I agree with you. But I think when the task feels so alien, it's important to start anywhere where it doesn't intimidate you as much. You, so, oh, sorry. you know. No, no, I was just going to say process. Like, that's why I was thinking process. I was going to kind of relate this question back to the painting that I'm doing for you know, those that are watching the video. Um, you know, I'm painting a room, and I rarely paint rooms. I don't like to paint rooms. I would rather just paint a creature <laughs> and, like, some grass, and it's easy for me anyways. Uh, so at first, I didn't start off with the room. I started off with just a little box, you know, I'd put an object in the box, you know, and then that made a lot more sense to me. So that in, in I think I might have just kind of answered my own question. I went to the little bits first, you know, I, I learned how to paint something with a simple lighting scheme and it was a simple object. And then I just bring in different objects, different backgrounds, different, you know, but same simple lighting scheme. Then from there, broadened to a room uh, mm -hmm. so perhaps that that'll work for Carlos as well um, but there there is a thing where you want to consciously try to remember everything you know because going back to your question how do you develop a visual library it does take a conscious effort to create that visual library Right, like doctors look at body parts all the time for years and years, and can they draw the anatomy as good as you know tuna? No, most likely not. <laughs> it's okay; they can operate on it. <laughs> yeah, but can tuna uh, do any operations? No, she can't. But you know, it's like where I you mean, put your effort, right? Not yet. Just kidding. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. Awesome. So. I think, Masse, you want to go for the next question here? Yeah, so here's a good question. Um, I'm actually also curious of the answer. So the question's from Adrian D. Um, Fortuna, your art is really, really expressive. For you, what is the most important thing to have in mind when you try to express something with your art? That's a good question. Um, thank you for the compliment, by the way. <laughs> for, for me, the most important thing is whether I feel connected to the idea before I think about the render, right? So every once in a while I render things just for the hell of it too, but the things that feel personal and expressive, uh, if I make a really lame doodle of it, which is generally how my doodles go, I hate sketching for clients because you have to like basically render it in the sketch and I'm not a huge fan of that. It doesn't work with my process. If I can't wait to realize it and I don't even know what it's gonna look like yet, I know I'm on the right track. If I'm thinking, well, this will really be pretty, you know, it's like, eh, I'll just kind of like wing it through this. Then I know the idea is not all that important. And the way I see it is the idea is equally important, uh, equally as important as the uh, render. So, you know, you can render meaningless things and sure, some people will like it. I don't find those things to be generally as satisfying as when it's a good render, but it's also a good idea because the render becomes the little bait for people to take an interest on something you want to say. So I hope that helps answer the question a little bit. Yeah, I almost feel like the idea is more important than the render. Yeah. You know, like yeah. we all know of things that went viral, things that really, uh, you know, hit mass media and it totally didn't look so hot. Right. And it's like this, mm -hmm. just this angry orange and it's not supposed to be the most amazing <laughs> thing in the world, but it's funny or whatever. And it's, yeah. it's the idea. Yeah. And then also comes to mind the things I really love that are drawn crudely for effect. Mm. So I think about Kate Beaton's comics or hyperbole and a half. And it's kind of drawn in this really crude, like, I don't know how to draw style because it just makes the comics so much funnier you know like the dog that's drawn with zero anatomy and it's like bending backwards and in the shape of a pretzel or whatever it's the it's idea funny. yeah totally yeah and it's yeah and you're just cracking up and maybe you're reading this thing for like i would go to kate beaton's website and i would read it for like three hours and it's not because i think it's the best rendering that i need to copy but it's the perfect rendering for that idea and you can't find those different things unless you have an idea you know 
Yeah, so. and we're we're pretty much kind of like in the era of uh, really good execution, bad ideas. You know, if yeah. you look at all these movies that are out now, and it's like, wow, the trailer looked amazing, and then you go and you watch the movie, and you're just like, ugh, what a waste of money, <laughs> you know, and like effects, <laughs> yeah. and my own money, and my own time. Yeah, so I, I hope it comes back. I hope good ideas come back. I mean, we can bring it back, right? All of us. <laughs> so. Damn right. Let's That's why it. I love hanging out with you, Tuna, because it's not about <laughs> just hoping and wishing and just waiting. It's not for Tuna. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean you're, you're a prime example of this, right? Like, you could wait. That's why we get along everything. together, you know? Yeah, that and just, like, really, we both love awkward moments, I think. <laughs> Yeah. You and I always are like, uh, are you seeing what I'm seeing? <laughs> I really take a lot of joy in that, a lot of pride. <laughs> uh, so let's go on to the next question here. The next question okay. is from, uh, oh, this one's a really good one because Comic-Con is happening next month. You know, this question mm -hmm. is, when you get a table at the conventions, how many pieces and copies should you bring when you don't have a stable art job? Now, this one is a very mm -hmm. interesting question, especially the last part that this person has added on to the question, especially when you don't have a stable art job. It should never depend on whether or not you have a stable art job. You know, mm -hmm. the, the, the guy, the person that's desperate it's even harder for you to succeed. You know, I think back to my friends in high school trying to find a date for prom. You don't want to be that person. You know, you want to try to think about uh, how are you going to attract people over and over again. And sometimes that's not bringing enough prints. I found that to be kind of true where, uh, I don't know if you think about this kind of stuff, but I geek out about this kind of stuff, Tuna where I'm like, okay, yeah, this year I'm going to bring 80% of how much I think I really need and then it'll sell out faster. And then what happens is the next year, a lot of those people that wanted something that was sold out, they come to your table first. The next That's year. true, actually. Yeah. Um, you have a lot more experience than I do, so I'm also curious about hearing your answer. But the way that the thing that I can contribute here is saying – Every show is a little bit different, um, and it takes a little bit of getting used to to know exactly what you need to bring. And even then, so something unexpected might sell a lot that year, or you know, something you expect to sell doesn't sell, but everything else sells out. And like Bobby is saying, I, sometimes I tell people that I can ship them stuff if they want it afterwards. You know, I think um, bringing what you can is a good idea. I am going to assume you said I don't. Uh, I don't have a stable job in a way to maybe mention that it's going to cost you money to make a lot of copies of certain things. Is that correct? Hmm. Um, well, and if that's yeah, the case, sure. then, yeah, <laughs> I mean, I was looking at the uh, live chat to see if we we're going to get anything on that. But, um, you know, doing what you can, you can only do your best. So do your best. Do the amount that's not going to bankrupt you if you don't sell enough of everything, right? And if people want more, you can always use the money you made by selling out of what you brought to make more copies and send it to them, right? You can offer them a little discount on shipping, perhaps. But I think it's a good idea to take chances that you feel comfortable taking as well. I've also seen, uh, I've also seen artists bring printers to the Comic-Con, <laughs> which oh, kind of solves a lot of stuff. I don't do that yeah, personally, that's... but yeah. That's amazing. I've never thought of that. That's kind of efficient. <laughs> yeah, definitely. But then it's like, oh, uh, can I get that print? And it's like, okay, hold on a sec. Mm -hmm. It's like, give me five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Come back in ten. <laughs> uh, by the way, a second ago, I saw that Andy was here. Hi, Andy. Yeah. We love Andy. Big shout friend. out to our friend, Andy Kung, <laughs> oh, storyboard Andy. artist extraordinaire for Powerpuff Girls. Oh. What's up, Andy? Yeah. Awesome. Also, genuinely great person to be around. So yes. that's why I hello. Yes. I want to say hello. <laughs> we had uh, a great time when Andy came to visit us in Toronto. Uh, let's go on to another one of my friend's questions here. This one's from Noah in Israel. She says, do you find a difference between doing art for VR 
uh, and other media? And if so, what, what would that be? Oh my God, yes. <laughs> Essentially, it looks like it's the same thing, but has very little in common with any other form of anything. Um, VR stuff, there's really no pipeline. And so you have to kind of invent the wheel, reinvent the wheel from scratch. And I know um, that you want probably like a more specific answer, but this situation applies to pretty much every level of the production. And uh, hence, it's quite hard. I think the closest thing it is to is game design. Actually, it's not animation by any means. But even then, uh, there's crazy restrictions depending on what the uh, platform of that VR thing you're releasing for is. For instance, a small example is we were building something that was supposed to work seamlessly on a phone. And that's very different than using a VR uh, based on a PC or based on a console. Uh, because if you are plugged to the outlet on the wall, you have essentially unlimited energy to use towards rendering this thing in real time because you have to in VR. But on a phone, you don't have that. If, if you're using too much of the battery, the phone will heat up too much. And similar to any other device, the device will slow itself down in order to not burn out because they're built to be secure that way, right? So that means if you start building on more than what a basic, basic, basic uh, engine could handle, basically a phone, off of its own battery not being plugged in, then it starts lagging and it doesn't work and it crashes. So, uh, you know, super different. The needs are different. The um, building a 360 environment, if you're building a full environment like our film, is super different. But that doesn't mean it has to be super, super hard. There were other spotlight stories under Google where it was just basically a one color backdrop and there were just elements inside. So that's, for instance, so much easier. And I guess, hence the point I'm making is it really depends on your production. It really depends on how it's going to be released, which sometimes you don't know. And it depends on the capability and the amount of budget you have. So super different. Wow. But also kind of fun. <laughs> A lot of things to think about. I remember when we were making our app, it was like we had the kind of like our own restriction, but it's still a restriction. We had to think about how big the app is going to be because people, they don't want to, you know, use up a good chunk of their storage space for yeah. an app. So all of a sudden that becomes a limitation, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. And you can build a really great program and it could still, like, for instance, I remember when uh, David O'Reilly built Mountain, people were into Mountain, but a lot of people kind of didn't get it at first. I think he was a little bit heartbroken about it. But um, it also drained your battery so fast that you couldn't turn it on unless you were uh, home and you were plugged in, which is the reason why a lot of people I know struggled with turning it on all the time. Mm. Now... It was great. Like, I really loved the idea. I loved the execution. I thought it was genius in so many ways. But that's true, you know? Like, you have to also think about the platform, think about the use. And, and again, this isn't a criticism. I think he was just trying to make something work that didn't exist before. So, yeah, there are some unforeseen challenges. <laughs> yeah, it's the Wild West, totally. Lots of factors, lots of factors. Now, I did want to mention something. I, I want to mention what it is I'm painting, why I'm painting this. You know, a lot of people might be going like, I don't get it. Okay, so the top uh, corner of the screen, you can see an image there. That's from Guardians of the Galaxy 2 or 1. I, I don't even know. But I was looking more at the lighting, the cinematography. I'm trying to apply it to this very normal room. So in the very beginning, I'm just painting the room how I saw it, you know, in color. And then throughout this video, I try to turn that room into a different feeling, you know, and just... Uh, taking uh, imagery f of, uh, you know, stuff that I like and trying to apply it to this very normal room uh, in mm -hmm. case anybody's wondering. And this is part of painting with light and color with Daisatsumi, Robert Kondo. This is one of their assignments. Really fun, really challenging, and, and yeah, really interesting, I thought. Now, uh, let's go on to the next question here, which is... Casey, 
Tuna, would you share your process for developing your ideas? Now, this is interesting. You probably start, I'm guessing, with writing nowadays. <laughs> I don't know. It kind of depends. Um, is this, I'm assuming this question is mostly for illustration, though, right? Maybe? <laughs> uh, it just is developing your ideas. Developing my ideas. Um, you could take it however you want and just roll with it. Sure, sure, sure. Um, so the, the, one of the practices I have is to make something every day. And for that, I do have to sit down and come up with something. Uh, and that's a form of ideation. And for that, I feel really great using it as a kind of meditation at the end of the day. And that means I'm kind of going through my day in my head. It's a moment that I have to relax after a day of conversations and work and maybe personal problems, right? So when you know that you have this practice, throughout the day, you get to make little notes or you get to make, you get to think forward. Uh, whoa, we got a little guy in that painting. Um, <laughs> and that, <laughs> he's cute. And it means, uh, you know, the things that get caught up in my head, I have a very overactive imagination. Uh, I get to process them into a drawing. So I think the best way to come up with ideas for me is to come from a feeling place. If I try to intellectualize it too much, I tend to be more worried about whether people are going to feel the same way about it, whether it's going to be meaningful to other people. And... When it comes to coming up with the idea, that can't be the focus. Once you start executing the idea, it's important that it communicates what you're saying. Because in the end, art is a form of communication. That's how I see it. So in the idea part, I try to, again, for that one hour or however long I'm spending on this thing, I try to disassociate with the outcome, the other people, where it's going to go, you know? And I just try to make it genuine. Is it authentic? Is it authentically what I'm thinking or feeling about what I'm going through in life? The odds are, if it's true to your experience, it's something real. And while it may not resonate with every single person out there, it resonates with reality because you know that's the case. So you don't need the outside... Um, outside recognition or the outside approval or validation that what you made is a good idea or it's important, you know. Um, that's at least my process for coming up with ideas. It's actually the same for writing. You have to trust your own voice. You have to trust that your voice will take you somewhere real as long as you're staying honest about it. And, and that's generally how I tackle things. How do you do this, Bobby? <laughs> How do I come up with ideas? You know what? I don't know. They just pop in my head. They just pop in my head. And then I, especially when, you know, if, if people give me kind of like a sounding board, you know, like avocado, then I'm thinking, okay, avocado, <laughs> what could that be? Oh, what if toast. it was like this? What if it was like that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or toast, avocado toast, which I love, Sorry. which you I'm introduced me to. So that was great. I'm <laughs> it was Basically, they they uh, they put us in jail if we don't get foreigners to try avocado toast in Los Angeles. We get penalized penalized for it. But I'm guessing your ideas like come from like obviously experiences and such. Oh I yeah, I tried to make that yeah, and then him too, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, true. Um, yeah, the it it comes from pretty much anywhere. Like, but yeah, sometimes it's like social interactions. A lot of my kind of like favorite ideas come from uh, in social interactions that I see amongst people or amongst my relatives and things like that. And I represent it as a bunch of creatures, which is fun. <laughs> um, so you mentioned that you kind of like do an idea every day. So um, it kind of relates to this question by P-Stone. Um, do you guys do art every single day or are there days where you feel like you need to take a break? And I know if you want to get really good, you shouldn't take breaks often. But yesterday, P-Stone was burnt out. So any advice or? So much advice. First of all, when you feel 
like you're stuck, the worst thing you can do for yourself is to force yourself to try to create more work. You actually will get so much more out of listening to what you need at that moment. This happens, I mean, maybe this is a nice thing to say on air, but this happens even when I have the pressure of a client on my back, even if I'm at the studio, if I cannot come up with anything, I will be so much better taking a 15 minute walk and coming back to work. I will literally leave the room unless there's a meeting going on and uh, I will be like, I'm coming right back. And that 15 minutes will generally, for instance, if I can listen to myself for 15 minutes, realize that maybe I'm putting too much pressure on myself, maybe I feel burnt out, or just distracting myself from the pressure automatically kind of does this. If I need a coffee, I'll go get a coffee. I'll walk around and let myself be distracted by all the nice things that I see around me. Maybe I don't have the chance to step out, but I will quickly read a comic that I like for five minutes. And, uh, you know, it's, a, it's one thing at work. It's a different thing to, you know, constantly work on your own work. But when it's not coming out, if you push it, you're just going to make yourself more burnt out. It's absolutely essential that you take breaks. It's absolutely essential that you stop when you feel that you're forcing something that's not coming out. And you'll be surprised that how much room that creates when you when you honor your needs, you know? I learned this the hard way. Like, I used to push through everything and then feel super burnt out at the end of every project. And I was like, why am I living like this? This sucks. I'm, like, giving everybody else the best that I have and I'm, like, depriving myself of any joy. And that's not cool, I think. I think you should be nicer to yourself. <laughs> what do you think, Bobby? Well, yeah, in the end, it affects your art as well. In the long run, you know, it's one of the things, one of the biggest challenges that all professionals know that very few uh, students even think about is the mind game that one plays with themselves throughout their careers. And that is like the number one challenge that happens with uh, people. Um, now for me, I've gone through my periods where I'm just like, I feel burnt out. If you feel physically burnt out, like your arm is getting worse and worse, which was how my arm was last week, then stop, take a break. And this is just my own kind of point of view. I'm, I'm sure there's many ways to look at things, but yeah, physical uh, burnt out. That's the only time I take a break. Otherwise I got, a bunch of ways that I get out of being burnt out. So one is uh, listening to something positive. You know, maybe it's this. I don't listen to myself, but I listen to, you know, podcasts and things like that. Uh, something positive. I will learn something. That one's a really easy one because you get instructions of what you're supposed to do, what you're supposed to what you're supposed to think, and you just do it just like this. This is a result of feeling burnt out. So I just started taking some lessons, started doing the assignments, started feeling, you know, some leveling up, and that makes you feel good. And then, you you know, it brings the confidence back. It brings a lot of the, uh, you know, juices back for your artistic soul to really soar. Uh, the other thing I do is I have, I start multiple projects. So you hate the current thing that you're doing? Well, good, because you need to do this other thing too. <laughs> so I'll have to shift, <laughs> and then I end up doing that. Um, I put in time chunks into my calendar. So from this hour to this hour, I would usually have two different things in, in that time chunk. You know, So when I get sick of one thing, I do the other thing. Uh, you're so good at that. You're so good at that. You're my hero. <laughs> <laughs> And then the last thing is that you want to concentrate on the right thoughts, you know, because a lot of times the burnt out stuff comes from stress, you know, is the client going to like this? Is the director going to like this? Oh, I need to do good. I need to get approval from this person, which you have zero control over. What you have control over is the time and the effort and if you're trying to be logical with what it is you're spending your time and effort in, you know, so just concentrate on that. And if you're trying to do that, then you're on this career path to success. You might fail at this project, but you, you, 
you got to know that in the long run, you're going in the right direction. And finally, a lot of times it's like you, your soul, your spirit or whatever is not your brain, you know, is not the feelings that you might feel throughout the day. You know, those are very kind of uh, primitive things that are going through your body and making you angry just because you don't fully understand the situation yet or, uh, you know, feeling like you need to go munch on a whole bunch of garbage, chips and whatever, uh, when you, your spirit, knows that that's not what you really want to do in the long run. You listen to your spirit and you tell your mind, shut up, mind! <laughs> I'm not going to listen to you, you know? I think we lost Bobby again. <laughs> <laughs> but that, yeah, that's literally what I think about and that's what I visualize. That's what I do in my head. I literally strangle that voice and I tell it to shut up, go sit in that corner. I don't want to talk to you. You're not my friend. Um, I, I actually love that you brought up the confidence thing. Uh, one thing I do when I am super stuck, you guys, or... Um, when I feel a lot of resistance to doing what I really, really want to do. How's this happen to you guys? You just want this thing so much. And every time you sit down, you're like, like, nothing is coming out. And then it stresses you out more. A part of going away and doing something else is I try something else that scares the shit out of me. So uh, a few a, a month or two ago, I was trying to write and it wasn't coming. And it was it had so much to do with me worrying that it wasn't good enough what I was going to write. I... Maybe I'm not as uh, effective a thinker as I am. Maybe nobody's going to be able to relate to this. And then I took my friend's longboard from their garage sale and her helmet. And me, who until the age of 29 had always believed that if I like, ever stepped on a skateboard, I would just fall and die, you know, <laughs> like hit my head on the and just die. I was like, I'm going to do this. And I started watching some videos on YouTube and I went to an empty parking lot <laughs> by the Dodger Stadium, and uh, in two hours, I got cruise. And you realize by playing around with that feeling that you couldn't do something and still being able to do it, you realize that that voice isn't always right, kind of like what Bobby is saying. So, you know, that's an opinion. And in that moment, it feels really right about you. But you go, hey, look at all the other things I thought I couldn't do. This feels great. You feel very empowered when you do something new like that. And you prove your voice is wrong, right? And then when you come back, you're like, okay, this is just another thing, and I'm going to give it a shot. It just kind of opens you up to the possibility of failing or possibility of, like, playing around with this idea. Basically, you want to go from pressure to play if you can. You know what right? kind of totally traumatized me as a, as a little kid was uh, when I was explained... I don't know if this is totally 100% accurate, but it, there is some something there where in Buddhism, they believe that life is suffering. You know, life is suffering, mm -hmm. and it's more just about being okay with, you know, the problems, the bumps, and all that stuff, and surfing those waves instead of trying to stop the ocean from coming in, you know? Mm. Yeah. Like, you take these turbulent turbulent things and you roll with it and you longboard with it and you you know whatever with it right mm -hmm. it's super important to realize that no matter how hard you work life will always throw you some curveballs like it's just so important to the true true strength doesn't come from never running into any problems the truth true strength comes from when problems come do you feel that you can handle them when there's a challenge, can you rise up to it, right? So, um, I love that. Did you make that up yourself? Yeah, I've been recently thinking about this a little bit. So <laughs> That was awesome. I like that. Cheers, man. <laughs> cool. So uh, maybe we could go on to the next question here. It's from Juan. Yep. Juan asks about the workshop in Mexico because we're doing the f uh, we're helping out imagination workshop. Um, schoolism mm. is and we're bringing a bunch of really cool artists to Mexico what is a good way to approach it 
are we going to actually make exercises there or just listen to classes? I already bought my ticket. Well, that's a really good thing that you bought your ticket, Juan, because it's already sold out. Uh, so, yeah, <laughs> congratulations on that. What I would definitely suggest is bring a notebook or something that you could draw in and uh, some art in some form that you can show, you know, because you get both of those opportunities. Um, now, I want to ask this question to you, Tuna, because for hmm. those of you that don't know, Tuna's very good at just talking with people, just talking with people that she don't even know, not even <laughs> supposed to talk to. She will go and be super Excuse charming me. and awesome. And yeah, you kind of are. I'm sorry. Uh, you kind of are good at this kind of stuff. So that's why I want to Perfect. ask you. You got any tips for the socially awkward people out there about how to kind of, yeah, be captivating like you are? I don't know if I agree with the captiv <laughs> captivating as I am part, but what I, um, what I find to be, both from, from both sides of the experience, what I find to be more fruitful is I think if you genuinely want to be present with that person, um, sure, we go up to people and we want to, you know, learn things from them. Like when I met Dice, I was like, how will, D like, will Dice like my work? Or my initial thought was like, will he give me any information that will get me closer to uh, what I want in life and so forth, right? Like, because he was an idol of mine. But my conversation with everybody I admire tends to be more memorable in the sense that they are a person. I, if I just go say hi and kind of stay present in that moment, I'm likely to actually make a more meaningful memory and a more meaningful connection with them. So realistically, you know, if your work is good enough, they will see it and all that stuff will happen anyway. But if you just go without an expectation of what you want out of this and you just go to... Uh, again, like make a meaningful memory with them. You generally will. <laughs> like a lot of times maybe they're tired and it's, it's worth noticing that they also are just another person, right? And I prefer to connect with people on that level. I'd rather know what they're like. I'd rather know their personality. So if I make it strictly business and I'm trying to squeeze something out of this connection, it feels very, very uh, false to me. It feels fake. Even if my interest in them is real, I want this to, to be a two-way interaction. I don't, know, I don't want it to be a one-way interaction. And that always, I think, prevails over, you know, hey, I need to get something out of you, come here. And not that anybody know, does this knowingly, but, you know, the people I choose to be around, whether they work with me on something or I work for them, I'd much rather work with people who are just, like, great to interact with. And I want to be that kind of person. So that's generally where my focus is. I'm just genuinely curious about the person rather than feeling like I know them or feeling like they owe me something because uh, they're further, further ahead in their career or, you know, they are a person. So that's, that's the level I want to connect on. Totally. Connect on. I, I want to add a couple of my own little tips in there. Uh, one is that you don't just talk about yourself. Like Tuna was saying, it's not a one-way street. You know, engage with them and talk, you know, ask about them as well. Um, asking for their advice is something that tends to be a nice thing, you know, because you're saying that you want to know what their opinions are, what they're thinking about. Um, and don't try to approach people right at the door. Because they're, mm -hmm. they're waiting to come in. If you stop somebody at the door, you're going to see them looking over your shoulder, seeing if they know anybody at the place and all that stuff. The best place to meet people is that little section, that little path that people uh, leave the bar. You know, <laughs> because they got their drink in their hand. What are they looking to do? Socialize. Hey, how's it going? You know, and you just kind of start from there. Uh, I... I found that to be kind of helpful. So I agree. I agree, and I think um, I would. I will say this much from my experience: 
the more meaningful, the more memorable things that I learned from people that I admired and met were more about hearing how they ended up where they got, um, where they got. And the best lesson that I learned is you think just because let's say Carter Goodrich is a great character designer that you can just follow his path and also be a great character designer. But most often you find out their lives were also full of uncertainty. They were maybe in his case, for instance, an editorial illustrator. And he told me that before he became a character designer, there was a, there was a point where he didn't, he felt stuck in doing editorial illustration. He didn't really know where to go. And he was trying to figure out if it was over. His illustration career was over for him. Like he didn't see a path out. So to see that even somebody so accomplished who is absolutely wonderful at the work he does can still be in that position, it kind of makes you realize that as you roll with life and deal with these emotions, you're going to end up in places you don't predict. And to see that they had to find this strength and muster it and how they use their opportunities, that actually draws a better example for what I can learn from than asking how they get where you are. Because honestly, they didn't always plan to be maybe where they are. And that's okay. And that's kind of true for so many people, right? Right, Bobby? Like, I think uh, a lot of people that I met uh, didn't intend to be in these positions. These positions didn't exist when they started making art. Oh, and yeah. that's okay. Oh, yeah, for sure. So many of us in our industry are totally like that because computers didn't even really exist, you know, when they <laughs> started pursuing the art. Mm -hmm. I didn't get my first email address until I was like 21 years old. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you guys snickering. That's not cool. <laughs> I'm just it's, joking. Uh, it's totally fine. <laughs> <laughs> I meant 11 years old. Okay, so with that, I just want to thank the audience for hanging out and giving all these awesome questions. I want to thank my co-host, Masei Seki, always being awesome and of course the biggest thank you goes to my wonderful super talented friend tuna bora thank you very much no way, for man. your time thank you for having me thanks for everyone for tuning in subscribe to this channel so you won't miss out on the latest artist interviews tutorials and other news slash advice made especially for the art community if you find these videos helpful pass them on to the other artists in your life thanks for watching